So let's get down to the business. So the topic of today is digital bond racing and why open source makes people better. And this is a big, big topic as, as discussed already earlier. But let's start with the Nordic countries. That's where, the, where the everything, everything started, at least for me. 27 million people in the northern uh, part of Europe. You are not American, so I don't need to tell where, they, where, where the countries are. Uh, we are found in num in, at the top of very numerous metrics, education, economic competitiveness, civil liberties, quality of life, human development, happiness. We have the Nordic model of economy and social structure, universal healthcare and welfare, and heavy taxes. That means high income redistribution and little social unrest. So the Nordic countries happen to be also a hotbed of open source tools. Very successful open source projects that have originated from the Nordic countries and probably the highest density of big open source projects per capita. A few examples, Linux has been made in Finland, MySQL in Finland, Sweden, PHP in Denmark, Varnish, Denmark, Norway, Norway, Git Finnish, IRC Finnish, OpenSSH Finnish, and so forth. There is probably some that I forgot on the on the to mention, but but hopefully hopefully you can forgive me. But the question is that why the Nordics are so successful with open source? That there's only 27 million people and so many projects. Long winters with nothing to do. It's already dark here, by the way, in Helsinki. So the uh, it, it could be one explanation, but no, it actually, there's a number of reasons. There's transparency of the society. There's egalitarian, open and non-hierarchical culture. We are very open to external influence because we are so few that we can't influence that much ourselves. So we need to be, get the influences abroad. The population is well educated. And then we have a history of doing things together for greater good. And this last one is the key, I think. As we, Finland, as we say in Finland, it's called talkot. And talkot is a Finnish expression. This is this text is I, I have, by the way, copied that directly from the from the uh, Wikipedia. So it's an expression for gathering friends and neighbors to accomplish a task. The task of the talakot may be something that is common to concern for the good of the group, or it may, may be to help someone with a task that exceeds his or her own capacity. A talakot is by definition voluntary. So why does talakot matter in a, in a bigger picture? So if we want to understand that, we need to go quite far that we can see close. This is a, this is a statement from a one Finnish future logist that's, that he said that the, we have no dreams anymore in Western world, that the, uh, the age of big dreams died when the, when the uh, astronauts landed on moon. After that, there hasn't been no big dreams. And if you think about your personal life, do you dream, feel lust for these kind of appliances that whenever I will get my first microwave or when, or when I get the dishwasher or whatnot? Or nice cars. Maybe some of you still think that, yeah, that that would be really nice, but then you start thinking about the cost of fuel, the CO2 emissions, the maintenance and so forth. It becomes a real burden. So in the Western Europe, Western world, we don't need anything as we already have it. And the, because the cost of living has gone down dramatically, I've just been reading uh, Thomas Piketty's uh, Capital in 21st Century that says that the, uh, most of the goods, the prices have reduced a lot, like in uh, it's 40 times cheaper, 20 times cheaper compared to 100 years ago, except for services that uh, 
taking a haircut still costs around the same amount of amount of money compared to the average wage. But the cost of living has gone down dramatically because we don't spend that many, uh, that big share of our money to food and food or clothes. So no more half of your monthly salary goes to goes to food or clothes that it used to be the situation back in the days. And the most of the other items, they do not cost that much compared to a few decades ago, and they you can accomplish with with them a lot more. And most of them are made in China anyhow, so they are, there is not that big big differences between and between the stuff either. So in the Western world, there are no material rewards for striving harder. The big dream of our past generations, probably our grandparents, to improve your standards of living is gone. Because the standard of living is already really, really good. And that's why we don't feel purpose in life. Because there's no dream that we are going somewhere. We are, we are dreaming of becoming something. But instead, we just sort of work and play constantly with the same churn instead of that we actually achieve something very, very desirable because there's no desires, as we don't have the dream anymore. That, that sounds pretty, pretty darn negative. So what, what, what then? What is the, <clears throat> what to do? And uh, if you want to feel sense of purpose, the sense of purpose comes from meaningfulness something meaningful, that you do something meaningful to you. The same future logist said that the, uh, if you spare at least one hour a week for something meaningful to you, you will start to feel meaningfulness from that one hour a week. And you start to expect that one hour a week. If you, for example, if somebody loves jogging or going to gym, and then you go there, once a week, you wait for that that moment, almost half the week. Then you are there, love the love the gym stuff and whatnot, and then you think about the last time you were there for the rest of the week. One hour. And as I'm speaking in a Drupal Jam session, I have a sort of faint clue that what something meaningful is to the audience. But anyhow, at least one hour per week to something that you love, deeply love. So I'll come back to this this uh, present uh, this this graph again. But one hour of your time on something that you love, and if you enjoy doing something, you are typically good at it or you will become good at it because you learn easiest to excel in the in things that you love. So if you have something that you love and you are great at, then you have passion towards something. And wouldn't it be really, really nice that things that are meaningful to you would be also beneficial to the world. And then if the world needs it, this completes the picture partially, that you love it, you are great at the world needs, there's now passion and mission components in the, in the, in the picture. And this is the concept of virtual talco that I'm talking about today. I'll go later, that's how it makes you a better person that you have passion to be on a mission, and then you feel purpose. The world getting better, as skillful people love to do things that matter. 
preferably together and with some kind of coordinated effort. Does this sound familiar to you? Which brings me to open source. Surprise, I guess nobody probably was, su was surprised in the audience about this. So if you would be, should be working with open source, you know that the, every contribution to an open source project makes it better. And there are people in this very hope in session in the in all the Drupal camps, Drupal cons, word camps, other conventions that I don't even know their names, that will benefit the work that you do. Most probably the people that are online now will benefit a lot because they will share the love to the same system Drupal. But if you implement something, let's say on Composer or, or on, the, on some other stuff that is shared with other projects, then the, uh, they will be mul the, the audience will be multiplied. And the ideas that you have created might also be rehashed and <clears throat> re-implemented on, on uh, other platform. There are people that can gain profession from their hobby. I have met so many people in the Drupal community that don't have formal education on the computer science. They have stumbled upon Drupal with something, maybe a need for a site for their some some loved hobby and then started to work with Drupal more and more got sucked into the community and then later found out that actually they have a profession from their hobby there are people especially on uh, on developing countries that can learn systems without spending money on licenses or certificates that you don't need to buy your right to code. You don't need to buy platforms. But if you have a laptop, not even a power, not, not, you don't need to have a powerful laptop, but if you have a laptop and with open source, you can work with no, no money needed and learn a profession or learn to do something that is valuable for your local community, even if you don't get the profession. And in a developing country, those countries that still have the dreams, that actually might be a ticket out of poverty, that you learn to use the open source so that it will give you a profession and it will raise your social status and your income drastically and it might be also to get out of poverty for the for your close family or your extended family and if we think about the developing countries if they would use open source they could use the IT budgets to force the local developers instead of paying licenses, license fees abroad. So using the same amount of money, but locally. So develop the platform to fit the specific needs and still keep the money locally instead of giving to the greedy business people of, of America and Western Europe because we have a lot of money already in these countries. We would be better off globally if the developing countries would not need to finance our countries, but they could use the money locally. And all of this would happen also with that the, the knowledge and the skills of their own people would raise, that you use the money you put it in the local ecosystem, you collect taxes, you collect local taxes, all the money trickles 
to the communities and that the skills of people in that country grow and they are more valuable in the global competition. It's one of the rare instances why you could actually eat and have the cake by open source doing the right choices in developing countries. But let's get back to the back to the open source, even if that, that that's that's grand stuff. But it's important to understand that when a when a open source project is successful, it will grow and change constantly. There's always something happening there. When the when the open source community big like like in Drupal or in WordPress or Linux, it provides new new roles and new opportunities for people. Some people will go, will leave, some people will join, but it will it changes constantly and there is sort of always more things to do. I think that the, the for example the size of Drupal has increased in all the major releases and we will continue doing so. There's will always more stuff that needs to be done. And there's need for more for more developers and the ecosystem around the open source platform grows also when it's successful. Every new developer that joins the community makes it stronger. And a stronger community attracts more developers. So it creates that kind of good cycle that the, uh, we, people, people are brought in because they have an interest on the, on the platform or whatnot. Then the community hugs them to be part of them. And then there will be more developers coming in the next waves and next waves and so forth. And the community becomes stronger and more, how to say, uh, multi-headed, multi that there's a more different kind of thinking. There's, a, there's a more of, a, more of a people that come from different backgrounds, diversity and so forth. So it's not the one single thing. Uh, there will be commercial opportunities. For example, today in, in this Drupal Jam, there are a number of companies that are sponsoring the event, which is great that the, you, don't, you, need, you don't need to pay to have a ticket here because of the sponsors, I guess. So the sponsors, they don't just donate the money, but they they think that there is uh, some outcome of the of the sponsoring so they see some commercial opportunities on sponsoring the drupal jam and when it's successful enough there will be dozens of companies that would like to hire you you there on the other side of the screen to work with open source, to work with the open source platform itself, to work with the client project that is implemented with the platform, or doing a implementing a fork of the platform or whatnot. There are multiple of multiple different ways. In Drupal, it's mostly implementing some something on top of top of Drupal. In some other communities, it might be that the companies like IBM and the Red Hat and others are investing in Linux development, that they don't build stuff on top of Linux itself that much, but they, fo they focus to keep Linux afloat. But anyhow, there will be a lot of companies like mine, Exove, that is also currently looking for, for people. So we are hiring. We would hire you. So the uh, jobs at exo.com is, is the address to send if you want to follow this 
this this slide, then there are most probably mo all other Drupal companies are also in hiring mode, or most of them. So if you go that path that you have the open source capabilities and you work with the right communities, there will be a lot of job offers for you. And this completes the picture that there's the fourth circle that you are paid for it. And now there's passion, mission, profession, and vocation all in same graph. And then purpose emerges from all of those passion, mission, profession, and vocation. That you do something that you love, something you are great at, something the world needs it, and you are paid for it. There comes purpose in everyday churn with open source. Thank you. Hello, Jana. Can you hear me again? Yes, yes, I do. Hey. Well, thank you very much. That's uh, that's really awesome. Um, Janne, uh, I have a question from uh, my experience being around open source community mm -hmm. for, for quite a while as well now. Um, I also saw it happening in the past that uh, open source community sometimes gets too big. Do you have yep. experience with that and do you have a recommendation how to deal with that? Uh, I think that the, there's, there's like two... I, Two examples, and the one is something that, that might might get people mad here. So let's see. But the first one was uh, was back in the days before Joomla was Joomla. It was called with some other name that I I don't recall now, and it was split together, and they had some argument there. So the if the if the if the community splits into factions, mm -hmm. then it uh, is sort of very very or oh, it's weakened and then it might might end up in situation that that it, it's actually splits apart like happened with joomla and yeah. the other one what is happening with drupal i think is that there's uh, so much talk in especially in the issue queue mm -hmm. and quite a little of coding and then mm -hmm. it goes that that you need to before you can code you need to convince a lot of people and then lot of lot of it lot of the time is spent with with communication it might be a good way i don't know i'm i'm maybe a bit too straightforward for that one so because i just would okay let's get cut the crap and then get get it done so it can become bureaucratic and then yeah. it's about the rules and regulations and, and and so forth so forth and then you need to have a lot of people to manage the the community and the people that join the community most of them are not community managers they don't really love the work of of sort of being kindergarten uh, cops but uh, they would like to focus on writing good code that also opens mm -hmm. the possibility to get different kind of people in the community that there, there are a lot of people that are really good at at managing communities yeah and they could contribute a lot to the open source community, keeping the cohesion and the others in a, in a, in a, in order or in a, in a, in shape. But, uh, I don't know how the community is currently sort of, uh, uh, lure them in because there's, they, they are not sort of requested by anybody, but we should have those. And we have a lot of those people, for example, Rachel from the DA is an ex excellent, excellent person in, in that sense. And a lot of others, I, I could spend like the rest of the rest of my night uh, uh, telling the names. You know who you are. Yeah. But uh, they have most of them have emerged from a coder. And if we would have both yeah. those that are not coders doing the managing, and then the coders could do coding, we could be uh, way faster as a community, also somewhat bigger. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and another challenge that I've seen happening in uh, uh, open source communities, I, I wonder what your uh, view is on that, is that if you have a mixture of paid people and volunteers, 
uh, in an in a association or in uh, a foundation around open source uh, software solutions, that that also can give friction. Do you have an idea or a solution for that challenge as well? There was a study made by a Norwegian university. I think that it was a Ber Bergen, but I'm not sure. But, the, but there was a study that said that the people, typically volunteer people, spend around seven hours a week mm -hmm. for open source community. That was the average. So it means that uh, I have used that as a calculation that it means that, that five volunteers mean one full-time person. And the, for the full-time person that get paid should give the sort of appreciation to the volunteer work that they that it's like one every volunteer is like one fifth of a of a full full time person, and that's quite a lot actually because it's also typically most of it is sort of straight coding or straight development and not the not the uh, that there's coffee breaks and, and and so forth. Yeah, yeah. So the, that that's one thing. Uh, the other one is that the uh, then the then the have a transparency and trust that the the people that are uh, paid are not doing the work according to the to the uh, their payers wishes only because that's very toxic also that they implement only those things that uh, that uh, their employer wants the good case is apple mm -hmm. that the, when the safari safari people provided stuff back to webkit they just dumped like half a year of code that here's yeah. stuff that we did and then it would, I'm not sure whether that's really usable or not, but it's not fair that it, if you would do that every week or every day, that here's some changes we did, then you would actually interact with the community. So it depends a lot how you interact and how you build trust inside the community. And that requires the community manager leadership and the discussion. Discussion is something that we have in Drupal community. And we have, we have now a good vision also where we are going. So I think that we are in good good hands in that sense that I haven't seen that many or heard that many discussions that the things are not properly organized in Drupal. So I'm happy about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, thank you very much, Jan. It's really um, interesting uh, to hear your view on it. And uh, uh, I learned a lot from it. So I'm 100% I'm sure that uh, people at home uh, learn from it as well. So I I'd like to uh, yeah, um, and here we have a big applause uh, to you. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you for your kind words. You're very welcome. Look forward to meet you in person next time. Yes. All right, Jan, thank good. you very much. Okay, yeah, take care. Bye for now. <laughs>